It's good to see all of you here. This is our Nature Journal Educators Forum. And today I think should be a really interesting topic. Uh, on our previous meetings, we, um, we brainstormed a bunch of topics that would be fun to do and unpack on our Nature Journal Educators Forums. Um, and today we're gonna be looking at the idea of what sorts of prompts, um, simple projects, easy to remember, or uh, short sayings, kind of the heuristics that kind of gonna help people kind of launch them nature journaling. And we're gonna pick everybody's brains and get, ideally for everybody here, we're all gonna learn some new ones that seem to be working for other people in the group. Before we do, we're just gonna open it up to kind of community announcements. Um, um, Avea, do you want to tell people about any upcoming programs that you have? Again, uh, uh, I'll, I'll let you tell about uh, things you're going, and then we'll jump over to Melinda Nakagawa, and then hear from anybody else that has um, announcements that are relevant to nature journaling educators. Fabulous. Um, so this week we are on schedule um, for our usual pencil miles and chill. So that will be on Friday mornings at nine o'clock Pacific time, my time, and Saturday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific time as well. And everybody is invited to just come and hang out. There's no pressure, no homework. We just draw and chat and, and you draw whatever you want in your journals. So looking forward to all of you being there if you want. Thank you. Thank you for doing that to support the community. Um, and now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Melinda Nakagawa. Hello, folks. It's so nice to be here with other fellow educators. Um, I have some exciting opportunities for you to jump into if you're interested. I have started, um, launched um, a six week series with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. We're doing nature journaling online. So that is a free program that the Monterey Bay Aquarium is sponsoring. So if you're interested, you can go to, um, we're still clearing up the link right now. There were some problems with it, but if you go to my website, sparkinnature.com and go to my events calendar, it's kind of like Jack's, go to the calendar, click on uh, Monday the 18th. And if that registration link doesn't work today, it will, we're gonna update it so that it will work soon. And that is a free six week or now five, five week series at the aquarium. Um, I also have a couple of other classes going on. So you can check my um, classes list as well. A brand new class about birds, birding, bird watching and using your nature journal to make you a better birder. So that's coming up in February. You can let me know if you're interested in that. And as always another free opportunity for you to journal with your nature journal mates from around the world. We meet every Sunday at 9.30 Pacific time. And um, I look forward to seeing you there. You can check sparkinnature.com, the events page. Um, this week we had a special guest, um, Victoria, who we did a whole session on mosses. Um, so if you didn't make that, come back again. We have more in store. We're doing some albatrosses on Midway Island later in the month. So come check out the calendar and hope you can meet us. Thanks. It's a really exciting news about that class. So for, for folks who um just uh this this um uh, melinda's class there at the aquarium is going to be really cool like they've got these cameras that are right up against tanks um so it's and you so you get kind of up in the face of all sorts of uh lovely critters um so you're going to want to check yes. that out It'll be a lot of fun. It'll be fun. The aquarium, the aquarium itself is closed, but we're um, recording or filming from the education building, the Bechtel Center. So they have some special tanks and some special cameras set up so that we can get up close to some of the other creatures that live there. Mm, mm, mm. That's oh, the and it is not recorded. It is not recorded. You've got to be there live. So yeah, come on down. That's right. Live sea cucumber, right? Yes. Get your sea cucumber on. It's going to be good times. Um, so now what I want to do is jump over to uh, community here. Are there any, uh, before we get going, any community announcements, other things that people wanted to share? If so. And on with the show then. So the idea for today is prompts. And so what the idea of a, a prompt is, um, things that are easy to remember, 
um, and and kind of get across some core ideas, and uh, you drop those on on students, and you then sort of see a kind of a sea change in what they're doing. I got kind of for for me the the my two kind of foundation ones are the idea of words, pictures, and numbers, right? And I, you know, keep saying that and I repeat it and people kind of, they can get it like, like, oh, words, pictures, and numbers. And then I will, um, actually, hold on a second. We can make this visual. Um, so when I'm doing words, pictures, and, and number, for when I'm talking about words, I'll write out words because it's a word. And um, then, you know, pictures, you can do, you know, what, what, whatever, you know, just sort of a, a symbol of something. And, um, you know, numbers, you can do either the, the number symbol um, or the, or you can just sort of write, you know, the number five. Um, uh, so very often as I'm presenting this, I will, have words as a words, pictures as pictures. And I think probably the best would be sort of numbers as numbers, right? And then there's a visual that kind of goes along with that. A similar um, thing that I do is sort of a little prompt for people is I um, just the idea of I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. That sort of has become our, a bit of a nature journaling mantra. Um, and for people who are kind of new to this idea, the idea of um, I notice, um, and for that, I'm going to put in a little exclamation point. Um, also, sometimes when I'm talking about this, I'll draw a little picture of an eye, but it's easier to draw an exclamation point. Um, so I notice is all about prompting us to enhance our, our, our observations and to take those to a uh, a, a higher level. All the nature journaling, it starts with observation, observation, observation. And then I notices, uh, off the I notices come the I wonders and um, it reminds me of. So a little symbol for I wonder is just a little question mark. And you don't have to make these block letters, but I find when I'm talking to kids, kids like block letters. And I do too, because I'm still a kid. Um, and then if you want to, you can put in just on one side of them, just a little hint of a shadow there. And then you've got 3D block letters, right? So um, the I notice is intentionally harnessing curiosity. And the last pit, bit of it is it reminds me of. And so I will put um, an equal sign for that. So it is like this. Um, another way of doing that, if you've got um, kids who are all a little bit older and might be familiar with, is the equal to or similar to symbol. So you sort of make that top one into a little squizzle. And there is, so you can have a little visual symbol for I notice, I wonder, and it reminds me of. And um, again, that is for observation, curiosity, and creative thinking. Um, the definition if we're using here for creativity is your ability to make useful connections between seemingly unrelated things. So useful connections between seemingly unrelated things. And it reminds me of really gets you practicing doing that. So this is an example of a prompt. You don't have to turn all these things into visuals, but something like I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, or words, pictures, or numbers. It's easy to say, easy to drop on our students, easy to incorporate into kind of a regular part of our programming, and it's game-changing. You know, the, the, I've, I've seen people kind of go from a journal that is, you know, drawings of things to just doing the words, pictures, numbers flip. And it just opens the floodgates for all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, so that's an example of, of some prompts. There can be prompts 
for large, you know, just whole processes of nature journaling or little parts of it, you know, so it could be when I'm teaching, um, when I'm teaching this subject, you know, here are the little prompts that I use just to kind of, to kind of pack around something. So prompts can be big picture for encompassing all of nature journaling, like the two examples I just gave, or a little bit more specific when you're dialing in on things. And um, I would be interested to hear from folks here about prompts that you use. Think of the things you find yourself saying a lot that are catchy and kind of help move the ball down the field with this. So at this point, um, at any point, um, you can unmute yourself. Actually, let's, we'll make sure that everybody can unmute themselves. Um, yeah. They should be able to. Okay, great. Um, so feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and share. Um, I can go. Um, so uh, I, it's Billy Joe from Ontario, um, up in Canada, where it's freezing cold right now. Um, oh. <laughs> um, so um, I've been using the words, pictures, numbers, and the I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of as well. But I found that I've been using um, a lot with little kids, like K grade one. Um, and so sometimes the it reminds me of their um, they might have trouble with the writing of like what that looks like in terms of words. Um, and I had a teacher the other day give me an amazing prompt was to use thought bubbles. And so maybe instead of the equal sign or the sort of go to or whatever, you can use thought bubbles because then in the thought bubble, they can draw the picture of what it is that re it reminds them of. So that in the last uh, like week or so, I've been doing quite a bit of kindergarten and it's been really awesome um, to get them to sort of think about that. Um, and then with the eye notice as well, we've been using a lot of eyeballs so they can use the eyeballs and then they can point to the things that they're noticing because they can draw that they understand that there's a hole in their leaf or there's an extra piece of their stick but maybe if especially if they're in jk so they're you know maybe have just turned five um yeah so they've been able to use arrows a little bit more or sound you know we don't focus on spelling um you know but maybe they can even write the first letters of the words so we've been trying to give our little kids a few extra different little prompts um but i've really liked the thought bubble the thought bubble has been really awesome all the way up to sort of k kindergarten um and even today i had grade fives um and and some of them were using it as well so it's just a little bit of a a different sort of take on it especially if we're having trouble with their writing um, or if you have ESL, right? So English, to write it in English, they could write it in their own language if they know that. But if they're trying to use the English language um, and they're just not quite there yet, again, these these prompts have been um, a little bit helpful, just in giving them a, a little different way to think about it, sort of thing. Oh, that's that's really fun. That's really fun. So yeah, I like that thought bubble. Um, so the, um, let me see here. And, and for, for eyeballs, um, eyeballs, the, there are, you know, this kind of eye is, is harder to draw. And then people, the more kind of complex the symbol is, the more people can kind of get distracted by. I'm now gonna try and spend all their time going like, I'm working at drawing my eyeball, right? Um, but, but these little googly eyes that are kind of staring at, and, and you can do them as, as separate little eyes, right? So this is fine. Um, but what's more fun is like, let's say you want them to, you know, here is your drawing where that exclamation point is, that's what you wanna draw attention to, um, is you can overlap them slightly and then have them look down at whatever you want them to look at. So you can have the eyeballs directed um, to to where you want to to see. That's fun, and I love that. Um, the it reminds me of thought balloon. This is cool. Um, and 
you know, I sometimes have in my journals just um, I'll write I R M O, or it reminds me of. Um, now I can put those into a thought balloon, and so that gives me some kind of visual iconog iconography that I can start to play with. I, that, I think that's cool. Billy Joe, you rocking it, All right? <clears throat> and and more ideas are going to come to you. So I want to hear from you again. Right. Um, let's jump over to gallery view again. And who's got another thought or another idea? Um, um, Donna, good to have you with us. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Uh, my little ones are always asking, uh, what is that? When they, they point at something, they say, what is it? And I'll, I'll ask something back like, well, what do you think it does? So they're pointing at the bend of a grasshopper's leg. Um, then they might uh, ask me, what, what is that? Or, you know, so and I'll say, well, what do you think it does? Let's look at what it does. And they'll see it move and then they'll say, oh, it, it's legs. Or he works on them. It's very simple. I, I know. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. This is the, the things like this are are are, are the, these little tweaks. Um, these are the sorts of exactly the sorts of things which we're hunting for in this session, um, because your little prompt there, your prompt of, um, your prompt of, what do you think it does? Um, you know, people will start with what's this, what's that, what's that, and if you answer, that's a moose. Right. Um, stop well, right there. The crown sparrow. Right. The, like here is the name that scientists have given to it, and that's not something that you can really engage with in terms of thinking. It's just like somebody named it this, and that's the term for it. But what you're doing is um, directing that interest in it towards um, what can be observed and structure and function sorts of ideas. And I think that those, rather than the what question, um, you know, what's this, what's that, what's that? I think very often what kids are really are asking when they say that is they mean like, what is going on here? Why is this significant? What is happening here? And if when we say, what's that? And you go like, oh, that's a golden crown sparrow. That, then that just stops things. So when you say, well, you're, you're answering that with sort of thinking, sort of directing them into to, to function and to rather than go for the name to think about what it does. That's something that you could, you could use that approach in an environment where let's say you don't know all the types of insects in the place that you're exploring. You could be able to, you could use Donna's um, prompt there really effectively with that. That's cool. And um, clearly a teacher. Look at the background behind Donna here. Uh, we've got, oh. <laughs> this is this is, lesson, this is sorry. This is the the the, uh, the this is the room of a working teacher right here. That's very cool. This is part of my classroom. So that's neat. Um, so thank you. Um, so along the same lines of um, what. Um, let's go for the gallery view again. Um, along the same lines of, um, you know, what do you think it does? What are, are there any other prompts that people find yourself reaching for on a regular basis to focus and redirect um, ideas in nature journaling um, or, or inquiry? Um, I'll jump in here with one that's more about um, the, the initial observation than it is about the application. Um, but the zoom in, zoom out tool, I find to be super useful. And kids often think of zoom in, zoom out as like landscape scale to something super tiny. Um, but I also encourage like, if they're observing a leaf and they make a leaf that's just like generic leaf shape, then let's zoom in on the leaf margin, or let's zoom in on the ribs, or let's zoom in on the shape of the stem where it attaches. Um, it, so that the zoom in, zoom out becomes um, 
like smaller in scale than like landscape to leaf. Or you can do like, I, look, I drew a tree and then, okay, well, let's zoom in on the bark um, just as an, a couple of examples. Um, and that really helps focus. And likewise, if they're like getting super duper into the detail of something teeny tiny and you would like for them to step back a little bit, say, okay, zoom out just a little bit. Zoom out to include, um, you know, all of the parts of this compound leaf instead of just one of the leaflets. Um, and, and that I've found to be very versatile. Uh, th that's a, a really good thought. Just a couple ideas on how to do zoom ins. One way of doing that is just you break the margin of something and put in a circle. People are used to thinking about circles as magnifying glasses. And so in that, if you see that it is serrated in there, you can do that. Another thing you can do is off on the side, Um, off on the side, you can draw a circle and do that. A few other zoom strategies. If I draw a little box here and then fan those little legs out from it, I can attach that to a larger box here. and be able to show those details. Um, sometimes when I'm teaching zooming in and out, it's kind of giving, um, giving some ideas of like how you could make that look visually, that gets kids excited. Like, ooh, I wanna do that one, or I wanna do that one. So sometimes if you give a few of these little things, they'll, they'll do that more. That's a, a really great idea, um, Tara. That's, and that, that's, because that's also, once they get that idea, they can apply that to every journal page that they're doing. Um, similarly, if somebody's making, if you've got a map you know, of, of something, you can just draw a little arrow coming off of that. And then you draw, you know, whatever object you found there, um, you know, All right, zooming in and out. I like it. Um, and, and zoom in, zoom out, easy to say, easy to remember, right? So, and also easy, super easy to attach to measuring and scale. Um, I really like having them like measure and then note how big things are on the page so that they can understand that things that are the same size on the page are not the same size in real life. Um, good for that cross-cutting yeah. concept about scale and proportion. That, that's right. Um, oh, don't you love NGSS? Like, thank you for something really useful kind of embedded in um, expectations. Um, show people, um, a lot of people may already know this, but when you're showing scale, um, uh, just a few ways to do that. Um, I'm going to grab this document camera. Um, one is um, just to draw a, a ruler next to something. Um, so let's see here the light on. Oh, I need to hook us up here. Bup -bup -bup. Oh. <laughs> um, so if I've got, let's say I found an object, you know, this is this really cool thing I found and I want to, you know, make a little diagram of it. Matt, can you move your, um, oh, uh, your board? So I just need to move this. Thank you very much. All right. So here's this little object. And I've drawn it larger than life size. 
Um, oh, it has a little curved line that comes up like this. Okay, draw it larger than life size. One way I can do that, <coughs> um, I can show scale on this, is that I can put this is a little bit less. Than about, it's about two. You know, this is roughly. I have a ruler handy. This is roughly one centimeter. So it's about two centimeters long. Whoops, where am I? There you go. So it's about two centimeters long. So if I put in a little thing down here that shows people what one centimeter is, I put in scale. Another way of doing this, my favorite way to do this, is I will use the pen cap itself as a measuring tool. So this is one pen cap long here. This is about, see how it takes me about two pen caps to get the length of the drawing that I've done here. There's my first pen cap, second pen cap height. So what I can do then is because it took two pen caps to get there, this is twice as big as the life size thing. So what I can do is just right next to it, 2x. So if I have, you know, I've got, you know, some little object and I draw it this big. Then you just, you, what is the measurement there? This is one, two, three, four, five and a half. Um, that's magnified five and a half times. And so it allows you to do that really, really quickly. Another great way of adding on, um, on a, <clears throat> Uh, let's say I've got a picture of a tree here. Um, there will be a Nature Journal Connection video coming out very soon <coughs> about how to measure the height of a tree. But um, what works often very well is in just on your Nature Journal page, you draw yourself right next to it. And um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll draw an adult and a kid. So just so that they can play together and hang out, but also the um, it then shows you like oh this is an adult height, and you kind of get you know if you're just kind of roughly that this is this tree is one two three about three and a half adult heights tall, um, you know that's within the wiggle room of of the level of accuracy that you probably need. You don't need to know exactly how many um, uh, feet or meters tall this thing is, this kind of little figure in there will give you that. So I... What is, let's jump back over to the gallery. So we're, we're getting some good ideas out here on the table, right? Um, what are other high percentage prompts that you like to use? Oh, I, I've, I've, I've I've, I've thought of one other that um, I could share. Um, so when I am um, kind of unpacking the, uh, let's see here, hold on a second. Um, when, I, when I'm unpacking the I wonders a little bit, um, the who, what, where, when, how, why, um, is a great thing to sort of regularly drop on people to get them to kind of be a little bit more creative in their, 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 their question asking. Um, so when you're asking a when question, when questions are to kind of get people to think about time, where questions get people to think about space, um, um, how questions get people to think about um, you know, you know, processes and things like that. So that's very useful. Um, I'm also finding when I'm talking about questioning, in addition to this, um, you can use the cross-cutting concepts themselves as prompts. So you can, um, what I'll do 
is just tell all the students at the start of an activity. Um, I, I teach them what a, um, a picture word is. Um, so, you know, for instance, if I, if I write the word fast and I lean it over and I put some speed lines behind it, um, or maybe even put some little shoes on, on this guy here, right? Fast <laughs> just became fast. Well, um, what I'll do is have them um, take the word structure or function or change or stability um, or scale and do a picture word just out of the word structure, right? Or function, right? So they write, you think like, you know, function. Um, then they'll, they'll write the word function. And, you know, if nothing else, just so you can get people to make, if you can't think of anything that you want to do, you can make bubble letters because who doesn't love, who doesn't love bubble letters, right? Because um, they put the fun in function, right? So, you can do some bubble letters and then um, you can, um, I'll, I'll put you know, leopard spots on this one, right? There's some leopard spots. Um, and, you know, you get whatever they come up with to kind of turn function into a picture word is great. Now, you do this at the start of an activity. You just take a couple minutes and have everybody create a picture word um, around um, change, right? Everybody make a change picture word. And then what happens is you go out and you do an activity. This just drops the idea of, um, of, of that cross-cutting concept into people's heads. And a lot of the questions, if they wrote function, a lot of the questions that they're going to be asking are going to be structure and function questions. Yeah. If you put up change as your thing that everybody, you know, picture worded, a bunch of questions and things that people just sort of, it, it suggests that little lens to think about things. And that, um, that's, that's very useful. So you can use um, use that with cross cutting concepts. All right. Are there any other thoughts we can add to this? I see that Laura Markham has been raising her hand. Oh, great. Oh, yes, yes, I see that now too. <laughs> the very useful raise hand feature, which doesn't help if I'm not looking at who's raising their hand. <laughs> Sorry about that, Laura. You are now. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, um, so I, I put one up earlier, which is um, just look up, look down, look all around because they, my students don't tend to look everywhere. I mean, they tend to look out like that in front of them, but you know, make sure you turn around and make sure you look down at the ground. And we, so we take time to make sure we do that. But um, I say use all your senses and then I usually put, but not taste. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then you can draw like an ear for things that you hear and a nose for things you smell. Um, and fingers for touch, but but I'm not very good drawing fingers. So, <laughs> um, and then we go out to the same spot, uh, and so uh, we I will have okay find something new or how has something changed, um, or what is something you have never noticed before. Um, yeah, I, I, I like what you're you're doing there. Um, the little kind of nose icons and things throughout your journal um, are are going to be 
um, are going to be wonderful. They're, they're fun to do. And so they, they also are going to, to, to prompt people then to start smelling things because you get to draw a nose. And I also like that you're giving, you know, a very simple thing to look for rather to, you know, if, the, if students get out there and there's no scaffolding of what to do, they're going to be, they're going to be lost. Um, but you give them, you know, just something, something new that you haven't seen before in this place. Um, something that has changed. All right. That is, that's great. That's good. Um, I'm going to show people just a couple ideas on, um, so if you're wondering like, yeah, but how do you draw a nose? Try doing this, just a bump that sticks out and end at that bump in a ball. And if you want to make it fancier, you can put the backside of the nose around that. Um, but there's, there's a little nose. Um, and you can make it kind of a cute little upturned nose with the nostril. And there is, there's the nose. And if you want to have it be like strongly smelling, you can do that. Um, we've already talked about kind of icons for eyes. I think those are Akshay uh, Manujan does these little uh, little googly eyes all over his journals. Look for those; they're really really fun. You'll see those on the Nature Journal Club Facebook page. Kind of look for those. He's the guy that got me started doing these little kinds of googly eyes. And they're really fun to direct people's eyes towards things. Um, here's a quick touch finger. Make a, a kind of a, a little wave and you curve the bottom of it and make another wave there. So that's that, that little bump here is the knuckle. And then put in a, um, a fingernail. And a quick little ear is a C. Um, you can make it either way. Uh, you can make it, you know, go C direction, but smaller on the bottom, bigger on the top. Give it a second little line for part of that and add a little tragus inside. And um, another thing you could do for sound is to draw a little musical note. And I like that ear better. Great. Um, let's go back to the gallery view. Um, any other ideas of things you find yourself saying redirecting, doing all the time, kind of high percentage ideas, things that can become a journaling earworm. Um, sometimes I find with the I wonder questions, some of the kids will be looking for immediate answers. Um, and I don't want to just give the answers away. So I always ask them, like, is it something that you can observe? So you can use your googly eyes to be like, it's something I can watch over time. Or is it something I can research? So maybe they can draw a little book or something like that. Because maybe it's something that somebody else, another scientist has already sort of looked up. Um, and then they can research it. Or maybe it's part of research that will get them to the observation part of it. Um, so I like to sort of give them uh, little prompts as to that and also let them know that some questions might not have an answer. So it might just end with the explanation or the question mark. Um, you know, I had a student ask me one day, like, does the tree feel when the leaves fall off of it? And I was like, that's a great question. And I don't know the answer. And I'm not sure if we would be able to find the answer to that. But I want to make sure that um, even if it is a question that they can't observe or can't research, that it's still a valid question as well. So giving it some kind of prompt or um, something that they can add to their page to make sure that it's still a relevant question as well. So sometimes the I wonder adding in a few extra things to it. That's, that's very, very helpful. 
Um, so if you notice, Billy Joe has categorized types of questions. And this ends up um, being really, really significant. Um, I've got a very similar system that I use when I am um, um, a, a similar system that, that I use to kind of categorize questions. Um, and sometimes things stick better if they rhyme. Oh, and this is also kind of an, another interesting thing. Uh, they did a little bit of psychological research. People think that things are more true if they rhyme. If you can like take something that's like just a horrible <laughs> idea, but you turn it into a rhyme that sort of sounds like an old saying, mm -hmm. people like, oh, that's really wise. Yeah, Not really think about what it's saying. So, but this rhymes. So three types of questions. Let's see, could it be, and let it be. So let's see, or remember, Billy Joe is talking about things that you can directly observe. Some things you can answer by your own direct observations. And that, that's what like most of natural history has come from. Somebody sitting on a stump and kind of going like, look what the bugs are doing today, right? And then writing it down. And then they're doing that. Okay. All right. And then you write it down. All right. So those are for all the things that can be observed. And sometimes, like Billy Joe is mentioning, like you might not be able to observe that now, but maybe some point in the future, maybe you come back with, like, what are you going to need to be able to observe that? All right, you need to be able to get ultraviolet goggles, right, um, or or whatever it is that you need. But those are things that can be directly observed. Those are the let's see. The could it be, are the things that you cannot directly observe, but you can use inference. And with the could it be questions, um, you know, like the, an example of that is, let's say an example of let's, let's see is, when do the ducks return to the pond? That's something that you can directly observe. Why they come to the pond then is a could it be question. And you can say, well, they, maybe they return to the pond at that time because it's gotten so cold further north. Maybe they've run out of food further north. Maybe, so you're coming up with possible plausible explanations. And the thing that I like about calling it could it be is that it makes it really clear of what you do with the first step of inference, which is what the could it be questions are. The first step of inference is to come up with um, possible plausible hypotheses, could it be statements. And then the third category is let it be. And so for things that can neither, neither be observed nor inferred, these are often really interesting questions. Like Billy Joe is saying, like, how does the tree feel when it loses its leaf? What a beautiful question, right? And so we want to, to, to respect that question. What we can do is we can say like, wow, that's a great question. We're, and just sort of be aware that if it can't be observed or inferred, it's just outside the realm of science. It's still a useful, valid question is just outside of the realm of what we can explore using the specific tool of science that's restricted to things that you can observe and infer. So um, those are the let it be questions. So as far as science is concerned, it's hands off, but then you've got philosophy, you've got poetry, you've got all sorts of other angles to explore the let it be's. So that's, that is a prompt that I find myself also when people are kind of, as we start to kind of dig down on thinking about the I wonders, the let's see, could it be and let it be as a triad. For some reason, it's also, think people like things when they're in threes. Um, and so, uh, and, and that conveniently comes in a little package of three. You notice lots of my things that they're in little threes. The, the Buddhists also like things in threes. Um, you know, there are, um, so they've got all sorts of little triads of, of, of things for some reason um, that, uh, that that's a pattern that people like. Let's see here. Any other fun prompts that people have? Um, Ivea. So I have, there's a prompt that I use, but this is actually something I could sort of use some maybe advice or help forming. Um, so when, when it's not COVID, I teach four-year-olds. Um, usually they're in their second year of preschool about to go on to kindergarten. 
And so I tend to keep it more open-ended because I'm not sure how specific I can get with them. And a lot of them are just sort of learning drawing skills. So I usually ask them, what's something new or interesting that you saw in our garden today? And could you draw what you experienced? And I feel like that's okay as a sort of open-ended thing, but I was wondering if anybody had advice about how to, I don't know, is there a way I could tweak that to make that a better learning experience for them? Any suggestions? Hmm. I'm not sure if it's advice exactly, but usually I'm out with my niece all the time and I'm trying to think of like, she's, she's gonna be four in a couple of days. And I'll always say, um, can you tell me more? And then if she's not in a talking mood, which sometimes happens, I'll be like, can you show me more? And she'll, she'll show me or she, she'll actively try to, to do the thing, like to be the leaf or, so I find that's sometimes useful. <clears throat> I like that. So you're saying, um, show me more um, or sometimes tell me more. I like how active that show me more one is. That's cool. Um, I think going into that nonverbal communication is really cool. So it doesn't have to be words and we can tap into um, people who maybe who are younger and might not be able to articulate exactly what they're seeing. Although what they're seeing is something that might be really um, interesting and valid. Um, I'll share a few prompts. I've got a whole bunch and I just wanted to just hear what everyone else had to share, but I'll just throw a few in there right now. Um, okay. Some things that I like to do with my students are, um, we start out with um, focusing on our different senses and a few of the different um, prompts that I use. One is um, introducing the idea of a sound symphony or a sound map. So first the, we do an exercise where we are if we're outside, we're outside in a circle and everyone with kids will hold their hands and fists. And we ask them to kind of, um, we talk about a little bit beforehand about sound, but basically sitting quietly, listening to all the sounds that they hear and holding up a finger every time they hear a new sound. And that helps them by putting their fingers up, it helps them focus on, on listening and it gives them something like, oh yeah, there's a new sound and another sound, and another sound. And it's not important how many they get, but just that that helps them focus and it helps them um, listen for the different sounds that they have. And depending on their age, you might ask them to just, you know, uh, count the non-nature non sounds or, or the nature sounds. And the smart kid will always say, even if it's a car, it's nature because man made it. And, you know, they'll come up with all these different, different ways of describing it, but it, it helps them hone that sense that we don't often use. Like we, we hear sounds around us, but we're not really listening to what's going on. So that's a fun one. And connected to that is a sound map or soundscape map is um, teaching them about, um, you know, putting on a piece of paper, I'll do a circle or a big square and put a little X in the center. And that is where you are sitting in your sit spot. If you do a sit spot, wherever you're at and having them mark the sound that they hear and so that they don't get too much in the journaling part of it, I'll just tell them to just put a little mark or put a little initial like B for bird or maybe C for car. Um, and then in that map, they'll, um, um, they'll show, so in front, let me just show you real quick. So if this is the sound map, you'll have to orient them. This is the, the where they're sitting and the top of the page is going to be the things they hear in front of them and the things they hear behind them will be on the bottom of the page and then left and right. And so what this does is it helps them hone their sense of hearing to direction in front, behind, side to side and distance. Something that's, you know, the cat that's purring next to it versus the car or the airplane that went by really far away or the person yelling on the swings behind them. Um, that kind of orients them to kind of a sense of place and using the sense of hearing and kind of starting out with, with mapping, you know, understanding the locations. Um, so that's, that's one thing we do. We also do colors. Um, I really like uh, doing a color walk. 
Um, when we're in person, I have a bunch of um, color chips from the paint store. If you go to Home Depot and collect those little swatches with the colors, I went through and collected um, a bunch of them in, in rainbow colors. And um, I would hand them out to my students and just, you know, we'd mix them up and everyone would get one color. And then we'd go out, go for a walk in this designated area and have them look for that color in nature. And sometimes there's like three or four or five different shades of that color. And it's so funny because at first the kids will moan and groan about, there's no way I'm gonna find this color or I can't find six shades of green. And then after they get over that hump and people start finding things and you're helping them out, you'll be surprised at how many different shades of colors they'll find. And then it gets them to look like inside the flower or under a leaf or, you know, under, you know, in the bark or on the different parts of the mushroom. Um, so it helps them be more curious and search in places where perhaps they haven't looked before. So that's the color walk. And online, what I've been doing is having them go to their crayon box or color pencil box, and they'll close their eyes and they pick one or two colors. And then they're gonna go outside and try to find those um, nature, um, matching it. So do they do their own color walk and then use that as a source of, um, of, of a nature journaling piece, you know, where they're doing that. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. So it's a fun way to help pick something. Um, another prompt that I use um, is ask them to go find something ordinary. So we're at home a lot and we are, the things that are ordinary are invisible to us. We just have not ex extended our field of view or vision. So I like to ask them to go to something that's ordinary, something that's always there and sit down with it and, you know, nature journal that, get to know that jade plant or, um, you know, birch tree or whatever it is. And, um, you know, maybe give them some other things to, to do with that um, known subject and come up with some things that they've never, you know, and come back with, you know, something that they've never seen before in that subject. Um, so that's the sound, hearing, um, textures are always great, you know, go and find five things that are um, prickly, you know, so you can do a collection, so it could be prickly or it could be, you know, has a nice smell or find five things that are um, fuzzy or, you know, you can fill in that adjective. And so you can use that kind of prompt with a lot of different things and maybe with the cross cutting, -cutting concepts, you can ask them like, huh, why, why are all of these things fuzzy? Like what, what might be going on with, you know, whatever it is that they have. Um, let's see, another one that I like to do is when they're not sure about where to start is I do one that's more than just one session. It's, um, I call it soil to sky. And so this is kind of a nature connection um, themed exercise where we start low and have them look on the ground. So look under, like lift the branches up on the tree and look in the soil and, you know, dig your finger in what's under the leaf litter, look low on, in the soil, then maybe in the low shrubs and looking around at the shrubs, what's going on? Are there animals in there? You know, what, what are the plants doing in, in this range, like elevation and then moving up higher to maybe really high up. What do you see that's high up? These tall beings, these nature beings, trees and, and rocks um, and then up into the sky, you know? So for my Sunday group, we've done the sky a couple of times and that's been super fun. Um, talking about clouds or weather um, or looking at the stars, the, the tracing the sun or the moon. Um, and then a, along with that soil to sky, adding in water, you know, where do you see areas where water is gathered? Is there a river or creek near you or a puddle of water um, that you can look into and see like, who's in there? What's going on in the water? Why is it this shape? Or, you know, why is it this color? Um, and then of course you could add um, other plants and insects and the um, birds and mammals. So I kind of use that as this overarching, um, palette, you know, and we can kind of start in different areas in our environment because like one other teacher had said, you know, we go out, we're not used to looking all, all around us. We're staring at a screen and where is the screen? It's at eye level in front of us. Nature is not only eye level in front of us, it's all around. So I really like giving them these opportunities to just do things different, you know, and it's really great for their bodies. Bending down low, getting on your knees. Oh my gosh. 
a micro hike so or a belly hike um you know kids love this have them get on their bellies and pick a little spot um this is kind of like J jack's um safari what was it called the the safari the, in the loop, um, you know, I have them go and put their arms in a big circle and find a patch that's like this big and then get down on your hands and knees and see what's there, right? There's a whole world. Oh my gosh, if you can find a patch of mosses, that'd be great. So giving them different senses of scale is, um, is a, a fun prompt too. Oh yeah, it's called String Safari in Jack's um, How to Teach Nature Journal Link. So, you know, similar to that, just, you know, a different riff on on the on that kind of idea so those are just a few things there's yeah there's a whole lot but i'll just stop there awesome very very helpful um Eve. i'm hearing melinda speak reminded me of of some really good prompts that my friend um julie tennis does she she had us do this this five-week thing with sit spots and um and then let me see here. Yeah, so so she decided to make each different week about a different element. So the first one might be air, and then we could brainstorm all the different ways that we could see air, which was really fun, kind of building off of each other. So having the class brainstorm and have ideas about, um, you know, who lives in the air or, um, or the winds or how the clouds move in the air or sounds through the air, just all of these different ideas or, you know, constellations, night skies. Um, and so everybody kind of gets all of these different ideas and then they go to their spot and then they try to just focus just on that element for the day and then just trying to map it out or maybe make observations. And then the next week it could be fire and that could be all sorts of things. It could be real fire, it could be um, the sunlight, it could be signs of drought, you get the idea. And then the same with water and the same with earth. And then the fifth one is life. You just kind of um, see who's alive. Or one fun thing too, is to look around and see evidence of life. So that even if um, there are certain things that aren't alive, you look to see, oh, are there footprints here? Is there scat here? Are there carcasses here? Former homes of, you know, nests or webs or whatever else. Um, so those can be kind of kind of fun if you have enough time with the class as well, the five, five elements. I like that. Um. So when you're talking about finding something new or interesting, um, Ivea, that reminded me, um, that got me sort of thinking about sort of along on a simpler, similar line. Um, the, you know, human beings are, we are really um, attracted to novelty. Um, so when you see something new, people will pay attention to it. Um, and once something has been around a while, we couldn't care less, no matter how wonderful it is. It, you know, around uh, a lot of people have seen European starlings so many times that they have stopped noticing that it actually is an utterly exquisite bird, both in summertime and winter. Um, but because you know it, you know, occupies cavity nests. Um, some places it's invasive, and there's tons of them. Um, we stop noticing that it is um, um, amazing to look at. Um, so one uh, prompt that I think is um, useful is to encourage people to try to find something novel in the familiar, right? So um, do you, what you have people take a look at some object you know, it could be just a piece of fruit from your friend, your pantry. And your challenge is to explore it um, to the point that you start to find thing or things that you've never noticed about it before that have been there in front of you your entire life. So that um, that's fine. Kind of, that's a that's a fun, fun prompt. And along with that, um, I find something that I I'm saying a lot when I'm working with, with groups of students, I'll, I'll start students observing something. And then what will happen is I'll, I'll go over here and start doing my own journaling and I'll look over back and uh oh, I, the, one of my students, they've already finished and we're just getting going here. And so the kids feeling like they're done um, after putting a couple of lines and maybe a question on a piece of paper um, was a persistent problem for me. So what I um, 
um, now do is we'll often let the students know that some way into, into this project, you are going to get the feeling that you're done. You'll get a very convincing feeling that you're done. And um, that's just, you know, your body's way of saying like, I think for my survival, I've got all the critical data here. And there's sort of a survival, you know, you, there's a utility and then your brain kind of goes like, let's go on to the next thing and see if we can eat that. Yeah. Um, but um, being done is more of a concept for cooking a cake yeah. than making an observation. Um, so it's great for baking cake too long and it's burned. Um, but with observation, the world is infinite around you, but your brain quickly kind of assesses something. Is there something essential here for my survival? And if no, then your brain goes, okay, cool, I'm done. And so you, what I now do is I'll tell students to expect that they will get that feeling of being done. And, and that, that, that has, and I tell them that that has nothing to do with how much you can observe. And what you want to do is look for that feeling because everybody feels it, I do too. I'll go like, ah, oh. this feeling of kind of task completion. And then what I do is I challenge myself to see what is the most interesting thing that I can observe or discover or the most interesting question that I can come up with after I get that feeling of being done. Because all the feeling of being done is, it's the point where you usually stop paying attention. And if you can push yourself beyond the point where you usually stop paying attention, that is where the infinite kind of wonder and splendor of the universe has been hiding in plain sight. So I, I tell people to look for done. And when it arrives, smile at it and say hello, greet done, and then just work through it and see what is the, what are the most wonderful observations or discoveries you can make after you got that feeling. And then it makes it kind of fun to notice done. And then when kids get to done, they, they're, they're not saying like, oh, <laughs> I'm done. They go like, oh, look, there's done. And so then I will, uh, in doing wrap up conversations with students, I'll say like, what was the most interesting thing you observed after you got that feeling of being done? Right? And um, you know, how, how many people were, um, were, were able to push through that and, you know, hands go up and you can have a conversation about that. I find that, so the, the idea of kind of calling out done and, um, and to the, the challenge of finding the prompt of finding the most exciting discovery that arrives after done. Is, is really, really useful for kind of getting people to, to kind of go the step beyond. You just gave me a really good idea. Um, a, a moment ago when you were talking about novelty and about finding novelty in the familiar um, and also about done, because, because like you said, when we see something and we've seen it before, then we think that, oh, you know, we've done. What I might try with the little kids in future is doing something, um, something old and something new, um, mm -hmm. so that they could draw something maybe new or you know different that they saw today, or maybe a, a sign of the change of the season or the garden or growth or something, and then something that you've seen here before, so that then they start to get into the habit of remembering what and where things are and how things are and noticing continuity. Um, so then that, that can combine, you know, memory journaling and all of that other thing. Maybe it's, a, it's an easy going way for, to start the kids off when they're really, really little um, at that. So that that way they're kind of doing both, noticing what's new and then noticing what's consistent. So thank you. I'm oh, that's to try that. I like that. I just wrote down something old and something new. 
Something interesting that I noticed the other day, which is uh, finding something interesting in the ordinary, is a lot of, uh, in Ontario, we've moved um, um, all classes in the province of Ontario have now moved to online um, because of COVID. So <clears throat> anybody who was in class and was able to kind of go outside, everybody is at home. So all of my classes um, have now turned turned to an online situation. And um, including, I, I go in and see behavioral classes. So they're contained behavioral classes and the kids have everything, anything from from ADD, ODD, um, uh, anxiety, depression, lots, lots of different things. Um, and so I said to the teacher, I suggested, well, let's, let's give nature journaling a shot. Let's see what we can do. And so I always let them know, uh, because it's a, fo a focus thing, right? I think, is it, Nevea, I think your son, right? Uh, ha yeah, okay, great. So this is perfect. Um, and so, uh, I, I always give them an idea of what they need to have before so a pencil, a, a, a piece of paper, and a piece of nature. It can be something that they've collected from outside, or it could be a fruit or a vegetable or a house plant. And so I had um, one student um, who I'm, I love. He's, I've known him for about four years, and he's a little bit all over the map. Like he's, he's kind of just a bit scatterbrained, but he's hilarious, and he always comes out with these uh, really interesting sort of things that he says, and it, it kind of comes out of the left field. So I said to him, um, what did you get for your piece of nature? He's like, I don't have anything. And I was like, well, just, you know, head to the fridge and, and grab something, you know, and I'm giving him all of these ideas of things that he can um, get. He says, no, I don't have any of those. And I said, okay. Um, and so then he comes back to me, he goes, well, can I use something that nature is in? And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, I have applesauce. So there's nature in it, right? And so I laughed and I thought, well, okay. And I said, well, do you have a house plant? And he goes, no, but I got a fake plant. And I was like, great, let's use your fake plant. And so I came back to him a little while later and I said, Antoine, have you have you figured out, uh, let, let's talk about what you're noticing about your plant. And he says, well, Billy Joe, I've changed my mind. And I said, oh, oh okay, What's, what are you gonna use? Well, I've got a grape. And I was like, oh my gosh. So because I didn't specifically say grape, he chose not to have that. Well, then the amazing thing was, and this, again, this is a kid who it's it's hard for me to get him to, to focus, let alone online. He dove literally into that grape and he says, well, I'd like to tell you what I've noticed. And I was like, great, like, let's do it. And he's like, well, I, I cut it open. So I noticed that there's seeds inside and then he starts counting the seeds and like the teachers, everybody's like, what is happening right now? Like this, <laughs> this kid doesn't even normally have the same two shoes on, let alone the fact that he is splitting the grape open. And then he says, uh, I come back for some, I wonder question. And he's like, well, I have three that I'd like to tell you about. And I'm oh, like, Antoine, I, I love it. And he says, well, Billy Joe, not only, Am I wondering, I've got the grape out of the fridge, but I'm noticing that um, it's not cold. And I wonder why that is. And I was like, okay, well, that's a great question. And then he says, I have more. So I'm just gonna keep going. Okay, buddy, you just do what you need. He then opened up the seeds and he was tasting the inside of the seeds um, to be able to tell me that the inside of the seeds were sweet. Like I was blown away and this all came from a grape. So just, you know, I just wanted to share that. And I, I remember Nevea, uh, like a month ago or so, we were, we were talking about how we can get some of our kids that, that have some of those needs sort of focused in. And I thought, well, what a, what a great story to share with you. Um, it went so well. Uh, we're going to do it again this week, uh, coming up next week, and see what else we can sort of dive into. Uh, and it's three students in the class, but it was um, pretty mind-blowing. But uh, the teachers just kept on, like, jaw-dropping uh, <laughs> moments with Antoine going like this is unbelievable and I said to him well you know did you want to share uh your journal entry I'm not ready to share it I really want to make sure that it's done just perfectly before I share I'm like no problem that's totally fine and then I said well you know what kind of words were you using because again writing right it's the focus of writing well I haven't written anything yet I'm using the Google translator so it's writing it for me and then I'm going to use that to copy down later to make sure that I've got it just the way I want and again I'm just like what I don't even know how to do that let alone this kid <laughs> anyways I just wanted to share that so the prompts can be again anything just amazing and you can still have these really 
having incredible moments, even in an, uh, a fully online atmosphere with the kids. So that was my that was my highlight of this week. It was it was pretty amazing. So I just wanted to share that. And Neve, I hope that gives you some some ideas with your son as well, because it was pretty cool. So. Oh, uh, hey, that story uh, makes my week. I, I love the story of, of Antoine and the great. Um, just great expectations. Um, and, and, and what you've got there is you've got a phenomenon. There's something in your hand and it's not about, you know, very often these nature journaling activities um, are, are, are equalizers, right? That, um, so that if, if I'm asking something of the students that requires prior knowledge, there'll be some kids that know it and some kids that don't. Mm -hmm. um, but everything that Antoine needs to um, become a grape expert is there in the grape. And because it's based on my observations that I can make here with my little grape, the questions that I can ask here with my grape, the connections that I can make here with my little grape, um, it requires no prior knowledge. And so you can get moments like this of like crazy student engagement. That is really, really beautiful. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. And on, on that note, this is going to um, be our wrap for today's um, educator forum. Um, that was was really a uh, uh, wonderful story, and and uh, I've also really appreciated people sharing um, sharing as many of these ideas as as you have um i'm just looking at at, at 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 my list down here i've got something old and something new i've got a piece of nature um, um uh, show me more um tell me more um what else do you see um, the, the, the senses the excuse the um, the, the, the new kind of look up, look down, look all around, or, you know, starting people just looking low on the ground and through the shrubs, up through the trees, up to the sky. Um, all of these are just ideas we can hold in the, in our back pocket and then, um, and share those with our students. And thank you all for, uh, putting those on the table for us the you can see the topic for next week's uh, um, educator forum is already posted online um, if you might want to take a look at that topic before you come to the meeting um, to see if there's anything in specific that specifically that you'd want to bring to that meeting and the um, and if you don't bring anything particular to that meeting, that's okay too. You can just show up like you always have. Um, so don't think like, oh no, I need to like bring something to this class to be able to participate. Um, no, we, we, we'd love to see you here. Um, thank you all so much for um, participating, sharing, and it's great to see all of you. Want to encourage you to find opportunities and excuses to get outside with your own nature journal Remember that one of the best ways that you can encourage your students to do this is just to make it a regular practice yourself. Um, I often observe that my daughters really don't listen to what I say, but they watch everything I do. And so I am, um, every moment, um, I'm, I'm, it's my duty to kind of role model what I want. So if I want them journaling, um, I should be filling up my own pages as well. And so too with our, our students in classrooms. Hey everybody, thank you all. Be safe, be kind, and I look forward to seeing you all again. <laughs>